How's everyone doing this fine Sunday morning? Good, 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 good. You guys are almost awake. I know it's, man, it's May. It's May, but school is out for all the parents in the room or all the students. School is officially out. I know that some is like a bittersweet. It's like, it's good, but it's bad. You know, I get it. It's good. It's good. I'm excited. Like my kids are already like, oh yeah, it's summer. Uh, it's so great. And then the very next thing is like, I'm bored. It's like, we haven't even gotten to Monday yet. Like we just finished, uh, but it's okay. We're going to. We're going to get there. We're going to get there. Uh, hey, this is the part of the service where we're going to worship God with tithes and offerings, and we're going to hear about announcements. But before I do any of that, uh, I want to know, is there, are, is there anyone here, which I feel like there's maybe a higher probability second service, although there could be here, here. Is there anyone here who has graduated in this season? You graduated. I don't care if it's high school. I don't care if it's college, master's, associates, undergrad. Like, did any, has anyone graduated? I have a gift for you. Maybe that will motivate you. I have a gift for you, but you got to stand up if that was you. Did anyone graduate and they're willing to stand up? Anyone in this service? Like I said, I have a feeling it would be more, more, not, but you have something to say? Huh? Oh, okay. Okay, yeah, that's good. That can be, the, we'll have to do that then. I don't, okay, that second one, I don't care. Uh, but, <laughs> so none. It's a really great gift. Okay. Well, then we do have one other person we want to honor because this is important as a season because in the spirit of, of school and education, we actually have someone who's here uh, who's attending our church who recently retired from a full career of education who's here, and she may not know that I know this, but Mrs. Cook is here today. Can you stand up real quick for me? How many years? Yeah, come on. How many years did you serve in the education system? 30. And, and how many years were you principal? 11 years of principal. And what was the district? Prior public schools. How many people know that we need good, godly people in our education system? Come on. And so she retired this her last year. What if they called you and said, hey, we just need you to come back just for a, a few weeks. Would you do it? Okay, there we go. Miss the kids, doesn't want to be the boss. Sounds like a consultant kind of a job to me. Uh, okay, we'll work on that. Well, hey, thank you so much for your service. I would like you to know, you can go out to the, to, to the Welcome Central and you can pick out any merchandise item that you want there for free. It's yours. It's a gift from our church. We love you. My wife will help you get that. We're just really thankful for you and what you've done. I think it's a really cool thing. And we'll see if we can get some graduates. Although I heard there was like... One of the kids in my household who graduated, they had a party at Incredible Pizza from 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. last night. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I was like, don't wake me up. Uh, but uh, they, uh, so they may be sleeping, some of these graduates. I don't know if there's other similar graduating uh, projects that are going on, but it was exciting, exciting time. I've been to a lot of graduations this week. I'm glad I don't have any more. Um, but no, it's great. I love celebrating. Hey, a couple things for you guys to remember. If you are thinking about uh, doing a small group or you already had a small group, or maybe your small group took a break and you're ready to bring it back, make sure you let us know. We're looking for more small group leaders, people who can step out and create some small groups. Uh, that, again, we do what's called the free market small group system. So that means you can create a small group about whatever you find interest in and you believe brings people together and for relationships. And so if you want to study the book of Romans, you can do that. If you want to go bike riding, you can do that. If you want to play Frisbee golf, or you want to discuss uh, the best pancake recipe. Those are all small groups, that, things that small groups can be built around. Uh, and it's a great way to create community and to create opportunity to learn and to grow and to make friends. And so if you uh, are interested in joining one or even more importantly, you're interested in leading one, reach out to us either at Welcome Central or you can get to contact us with us online so that we can get you connected and find some next steps for you uh, because we think that's really great. Uh, also, uh, we have a daughters this Tuesday night, correct? And it's the last one of this semester, the spring semester. They're going to be meeting uh, at 7 o'clock in the youth room. It's going to be a really great time as they wrap up their study in Proverbs. It's just been a really good time. I know it's been really good. I've enjoyed the conversations that have come out of it, uh, and it's really cool. Uh, and then... 
A couple things just for our kids' classes. I mentioned that last weekend in two weeks we'll be moving up all of our kids. So if you've got a third grader, there'll be a fourth grader, et cetera. So that's happening the first weekend in June. And then DCY, our youth group, their senior night is going to be the 25th where we get to celebrate all the seniors. Uh, and their last night in the youth group is going to be a really uh, fun time. So just lots of stuff, lots of transitions happening. It's a fun season. And who would think that this first week of summer vacation in May, it's going to be like in the mid-60s, like it's spring all over. It's just great. It's going to be great. I know. Praise the Lord. He loves us. Uh, Hey, I want to share with you a thought about offering. Uh, I actually was uh, heard this last night, and I thought, man, what, what a great verse. I wanted to share it with you. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24, it says, Let us think of ways to motivate one another to, to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Verse 25, I've heard many times talking about it, and pastors love to use that one to compel people to go to church. Like, we know what the Bible says, don't neglect the gathering of yourselves together. It's a good way to, like, make something, like, haven't seen you in three weeks, and you know what the Bible says, don't neglect the gathering yourself. But... I often have not read in contextually the verse before, and I love where it's talking about, uh, everything before is talking about God's promises, but I love this idea where it talks about, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Acts of love and good works. And continue to gather together in oneness. Like, what a, what a beautiful concept to me this idea is, is how we together as the body of believers, as we together as the church, both in the context of us here at Destiny Church in this local church context, but also in the greater church context, that we get to understand that we can encourage one another in ways in which we can drive each other to acts of love and kindness and goodness. And that can be showing love to someone that you don't know, that can be giving to a church or an organization, that can be serving in a kid's classroom, uh, that can be a kind word to someone who needs it uh, in your daily life, that can be putting up with a coworker who is sometimes difficult to deal with. But these are all ways that we can encourage each other, that we can lift up each other. And that's why it's so important for us to come together and to gather and to be in this place and to worship the name of God. Because in this context, it's in this place that we can relationally draw close together, that we can relationally draw in oneness together, that we can encourage each other. Like, hey, I see what you're doing. Continue to do it. It, it is not unnoticed what you're doing. And I want to tell you here, what you're doing is not unnoticed. How you live is not unnoticed. The way that you interact in your community and around people and the people that you love and the people that you talk to and the way that you give and the way that you serve, it is not unnoticed. It is something that is seen. You look different. And just because someone hasn't come and told you and said, hey, you changed my life today because you let me go in front of you at the coffee line at work. I'm telling you, it makes a difference. It makes an impact and it opens up an opportunity to show Jesus in really true, meaningful and profound ways. So continue, continue to motivate one another to acts of love and good works because I believe that that is a great way for us to show Jesus together. So let's do this, let's pray and we're gonna uh, collect our offering today. Father, we thank you so much for today. Lord, for the opportunity we have to give, Father God, that we as a church can give to this incredible group of believers, this incredible church that's making a difference in our community of Broken Arrow, that's showing Jesus to people who desperately need them, Father. We thank you for that. We thank you for that opportunity. Lord, bless these offerings. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna get right into it today and I'm gonna give just a brief 
recap of where we've been uh, as a church because I, I, I'm worried to this morning that I bit off more than I can chew today of how much we're going to cover, but I believe and I think it's going to be good. I think it's going to encourage you uh, today, but we're in our, the fourth week of our series called Formed, and we've been looking at what does it mean to be spiritually formed and transformed into the image of God and to experience his presence in every area of our daily lives. And a couple of the key scriptures we've been reading uh, throughout is found in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. It says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Then verse 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good pleasing and perfect will. And so we've been looking at what does it mean to not conform to the pattern of this world, but to be transformed uh, into the image of God and, and how he would like to see us live. Uh, and then we've also been looking at Mark chapter 12, verse 30, when Jesus answers this question of, of how we can follow God or what's the most important commandment. And it says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And second is equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. No other command is greater than these. And this is Jesus giving this expression of that, how we can love and experience God's presence fully, but how he would like to be in relationship with us in multiple levels at every level. And we've taken some time over the last couple of weeks to talk about uh, the whole person and who is that and these there's these five distinct areas that we feel like I've mentioned here in Scripture and how we can experience God's transformative presence and power in every one of those. I'm going to ask the guys to show uh, that slide real quick. But we have this whole person, your spirit, which is your, your heart and your will, your mind, which is your thoughts, the body, your social construct, everything that you interact with, and then all of that is encapsulated in your soul. And then last week, we kind of talked about the idea that God is desiring for this process of renewal, that he wants to take us through this journey. And historically, we looked at it, and we got to cover it through the life of uh, Hosea, uh, this idea that he wants to renew you from the place where you're at and the place where society is to the place where we experience his presence in a daily way. And we went through these, these kind of steps, this whole decline, holy discontent, preparation, contending, pattern, remnant, renewal. Uh, and so if you've missed any of the last few weeks, I highly encourage you to go back and listen to the podcast or watch uh, the YouTube video. I think it'll encourage you. I think it'll help be contextual. You're going to see a lot and hear a lot of these concepts and some of these graphs and some of these things as we continue uh, pretty regularly um, because I, I believe that as we continue to understand and see how they interact, it really makes a difference in seeing the connections. It took months and months and months for me to start to realize and to piece together how some of these things are interconnected and interwoven. And so it's kind of through repetition. So if you're like, didn't we see that last week? The answer is yes. Uh, you did, and you'll probably see it next week too, but we're going to look at it from slightly different ways so we can fully understand it uh, a little bit better. And today, we are going to be uh, looking at this idea of holy discontent and, and looking at it a little bit more uh, carefully uh, and what that looks like. And holy discontent, if you remember the graph, it comes usually after a period of decline. And remember, we can be talking about a personal walk or journey, uh, or we can be talking about a society as a whole. Uh, society as a whole, we can see these periods of decline. And, you know, here's what's wild uh, about these periods uh, of decline. If you looked around, at least if you believe the way that we believe, if you hold the Bible to be truth and the moral values that we see there, we can look at our culture and society and say, well, we're, we're living in a society where we can see some of these moralistic values be declining. Uh, we can see church attendance as a whole declining. Uh, we can see many factors that we can say we see in decline. And then you add to the fact that it seems like every couple of months we are experiencing new crisis, some kind of global crisis, whether it's the pandemic, whether it's elections, whether it's political, whether it's war, whether it's supply shortages, whether it's that we can't get baby formula on the shelves. Like there's new supply problems at every turn and we experience crisis and it can be really disheartening to feel like oh it's crisis after crisis after crisis and hardship after hardship after hardship but I have good news for you when you look historically almost almost without exception the greatest times of renewal 
the greatest times when people begin to turn their lives to God is not in prosperity and good times. It's in the middle of crisis. That crisis drives people to God. And I believe, like what we talked about in week one, we're experiencing crises because we are seeing a system that the world has been attempting to install within our planet failing and crumbling. And as a result of that failure, we are seeing crisis at every turn. And I believe that this is an opportunity for the church to be bold and to rise up and to show the love of Jesus in a way that transforms them and says, listen, there's a different way. There's another way. There's the truth that we can walk in and we can bring this thing in. And, and so when we, when we look at these times, when we look at this season, we can become overwhelmed or disheartened because it feels like at every turn, there's another thing. Listen, Know that for every crisis, there's an opportunity to win people with the love of Jesus. There's an opportunity to show his goodness, to be love and hope in a hopeless world. You guys have probably experienced it. There's not a lot of hope out there on Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, Facebook, Twitter. There's not hope. The only hope can be found in Jesus. The only true hope can be found in who he is. And so we get to look at this season and be like, okay, God. You have me in such a time as this. Just like after you, we were here for such a time as this. Placed here, strategically, before the foundations of earth, to show the goodness of God to people. And so, we're in this time but of change and crisis and transition, and we could do that. And maybe you've been experiencing what we talked about last week, this idea of holy discontent. You look around, you're like, I I don't fully know what needs to change in my life or fully understand what needs to change around me, but I know this isn't right. I know this isn't right. Uh, But that's where we kind of can find ourselves. And and, and again, you can maybe be in multiple places at the same time, but, but I wanna look at this feeling of holy discontent and how it moves from there into this transition of preparation and what we're talking about here. So I wanna read a verse to you found in Colossians chapter one, a couple verses actually, starting in verse 15, it says this, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. Before I read the last verse, I often think of when I read this scripture, uh, I think C.S. Lewis was like brilliant in some of his stories of like r- taking some of these scriptural ideas and giving us like this really amazing lines that are not necessarily scripture, but to me it like it encapsulates it. And I love this line in the, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe where after Aslan dies, like if, I don't want to spoil this book for anyone, but it's like really old, so sorry. Um, it, like after Aslan dies, who's the Christ figure? So surprise, surprise, he raises back from the dead and he's back and they're like, what? happen, you know, there's like this whole requirement, there's this like magic, there's this thing that was required, the penalty of death was required. And he said, before it was formed, there was magic that they didn't know about. Before it was formed, before it was there, I was there. And there was things that were written that you have no understanding of. Before, I want you to think about this, before the world was created, Jesus was. He was, and through him, all things were created. Through him, in partnership with God the Father and God the Spirit, through him. It is something that we can think about it, but you can never fully understand. It's something that's uncomprehensible. But then it puts this verse, I think, in clarity, because verse 17, it says, he existed before anything else, and he holds all creation Together, The word how the New Living Translation creates, uh, translates all creation together, I think is a good translation. But the, the Greek word that's there is actually the derivative word that we get our word systems. Systems. Jesus Christ, he holds all the systems of the world together. 
and, and I know this can maybe be a little modern words, but it, I think it puts it contextually. The God that we serve is not a God of chaos, he's a God of order. And as a result of order, he has processes and systems in place in this world. There are processes and systems in place in this world, which is why, by the way, the Bible is full of these examples. You cannot believe in God, but walk in his processes and systems and actually see his goodness as a result, because when you follow his processes and systems, they work. Now, they work even better when you're in relationship with him, and they work better when you're able to allow him to rule in your life, and it's easier to maintain when he's the one empowering you to do it. But he is a God of order who creates processes and systems. That's what we looked at the renewal process last week. But today I want to look at an idea of a system, and and, and here's what I mean uh, by system. I'm going to put it in a term I think we understand. Used to, like they used to call it like computer systems, but now we just call them computers, right? Like I know, I'm old. <laughs> and some of you are like, well, if you're old, I you know, okay, it's just a downward spiral, okay? We're all young in Jesus, okay? <laughs> but a computer is a system. And here's what I mean by a computer. If we really get down to just the really basic thing, you have your computer, and your computer receives inputs. You, the user, you're inputting into your computer, or uh, for you young people, your phone, uh, which I hate to tell you is a computer, but no, just, okay, don't get me confused, okay? You, you put inputs into the system, into the computer, right? There's inputs that go, right? And then within that computer, there's, we would call it like reserves or storage, right? And that's where all the stuff that you're inputting is stored, and at some point, you're gonna have an output. You're gonna receive something from that. There's gonna be images or documents or data or whatever it is that you're going to, to receive. So you've got things that are inputted in the system, things that are stored or reserved into the system. There's an output from that system. And then now, especially modern, this is like not hard to imagine. It was the time it was a little harder. These systems are connected together, right? Like we have things like networks and internet. And like these systems are connected so that like the output from my device can go to the input of your device. Like, right, like you guys know what I'm talking about. You're all very smart. It's 2022 and we, we understand computers and how they work. Kind of. We kind of understand how they work. So, so this is an idea. This is a system. But as much as this is a system, this idea of inputs, reserves, outputs, and connections... God, the, the, the author of all things, I believe is the one who we draw inspiration in creating anything man-made that's a system. And, and so I believe that there's processes and views of systems within scripture that are really pointing to pictures of how we relate to God. Uh, and I wanna look at this, Psalms chapter one, verse one, it says, oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join with the mockers but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. Verse three, they are like trees. You guys know how much I love trees. <laughs> just in case you're curious, every time it says trees, just imagine yourself in the scripture. You're the tree, trees are humans. You're a tree, trees are you, you're welcome. They are like trees planted along the riverbank bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. Now, maybe you caught it already because you're very smart, but let me just in case you're doing it. So here's the thing. We have this picture that's being planted. It says trees, which is you and I. And our other example would be the computer, but you and I, we are planted along a riverbank. And the godly get an input of God's presence. You receive an input of God's presence. And guess what? The way he says it, when you follow God, when you love God, when you, when you, when you trust him, when you meditate on his word, when you, when you are putting your heart fully towards him, it doesn't just say like you will get his presence whenever it happens to rain because that would be conditional. He says you'll be like a tree that's planted by a river, a reserve that is unending the unending process of his presence fully flowing through your life at every time. And the result of experiencing his presence continually is that you bear fruit. You output fruit in your life. 
so that when the input is God and the reserve is his presence of unabounding love for you and goodness for you and mercy for you, the result is you output fruit. But the fruit is actually not for you. It is the thing that connects you to others to see, to taste and see that the Lord is good. That there's this system There's this system that God wants, that the more we experience his presence, the more we realize we're right here by the source. I can never draw more than what the river has for me. My roots just keep getting deeper and absorbing more, but yet the water is unending. It is ever flowing, but the fruit is bearing in every season so that others can taste and see that the Lord is good. This is the result of living in God's systems where in my heart and my mind and my body and in my social structure and in my soul, I experience the presence of God and I invite him into the presence of God so that every place that I find him there, I see his input. And as a result, his output is fruitfulness in my life. You see, there's this this connection. Jesus takes this connection and he continues it in John 15 when he says, yes, I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Well, Psalms continues on in verse four. Remember, you'll be like a tree planted along a riverbank bearing much fruit in season. Their leaves will never wither. They'll prosper all they do. But in verse four, but not the wicked, Okay, now what are we talking about the wicked? People who don't practice the presence of God. People who have rebelled and have run away from the presence of God, who have run away from his goodness, who have defined what is good in their own eyes, who have decided I no longer want to be in communion with you, but I'm moving away. I don't have to name a sin. That's not what makes you wicked. What makes you wicked in this instance is being cut off from the source. Not the wicked. They are like worthless chaff scattered by the wind. What's, what's chaff? Chaff, like, like you may be like, I don't know, like we can think about wheat and stuff, but what is really talking, like the picture really is more like a, it's just a dried up tree. You're a tree that was planted with no water, with no river. You have wicked input and no reserve. And so the output is death decay and destruction. It's the system. What you put in is what you get out. Like it's the system, it's the process. And the wicked are like chaff that ultimately burn up and die, not because, listen, not because God hates them, but because they never allowed him to water and flourish their life, which was abundant for them, which is abundant for them. Which is the mission that we have as believers is to take people who are planted in dry, desolate places and say, I have good news. The moment you accept Jesus, it says the part of you, the most important part of you is cut off from wherever you're planted and you are grafted into a new tree that is planted by the river so that you have a continual source. And if the roots are holy, then you are holy. Good news. It's good news, trees. There's hope no matter where you're planted. Because some people say, I was planted too far away. I was planted in a really deserted desert place. Some of you came from a really deserted and desert place. Some of you got to grow up in good homes and Christian homes with a mother and father who loves you. You came from a good place and it was easy because the river was right there. But some of you came from a really distant desert place. You know who you are. God knows who you are. But we serve the shepherd who goes into distant places, who rescues those saplings and brings them to cool places to drink so that you can be fruitful. That's who he is. You and I are encouraged in our life to go out into the dry, desolate places as ones who have a tap root always to the water to bring refreshment and to search for those who want to be drawn closer to the water. It's our Life's call. It's our purpose. It says they'll be condemned at the time of judgment. Sinners will have no place among the godly. For the Lord watches over the path of the godly, but the path of the wicked 
leads to destruction. They dry up. So here's the thing. Within our lives, if we were to really break it down into three major things that, that we need, and, and I'm not talking about like food and water and air, like I'm not talking about that, but like major ideas of what we need, major concepts. There's three major things that we need to thrive as human beings. One is you need freedom. Oppression and bondage does not allow you to thrive in your life. That is why slavery is so evil and has been evil since the beginning of time. That it creates the way that you cannot do it. And that is why that verbiage is used in scripture that you are no longer slaves to sin, but instead you are now righteous because of Jesus, that the bonds of slavery were broken in your life. So we need freedom. The second thing we need, this is really important, is we need meaning. Humans were designed to have meaning and purpose in their life. Maybe you've experienced times where you felt like your life was meaningless or what you did was meaningless or very minimal meaning. And that is never a fun place to be when you live and you think I don't make any difference, I don't have any purpose, I don't have any meaning. You are required and you are in need of meaning in your life to feel like you are making a difference that is why Jesus invites you not to lay around and do nothing, but to partnership, partner in his mission to save lives because he gives you meaning and purpose. Because you need it. You were designed that way. That's why when he took Adam and Eve and he put them in the garden, he didn't say, lay in hammocks and drink out of coconuts and everything will be fine. No, he said, tend the garden, take dominion over it and be fruitful while you watch over everything. He gave them purpose. Then the third thing, relationships. You know, Adam and Eve had all three of these. They had the freedom to choose. They had purpose, and God said it's not good for man to be alone. Be in relationship. Be in relationship. Have relationships is the third thing that is required. And, and, I'm, and you hear this, and it's like, yeah, it makes sense. I, I need to have freedom. I need to have meaning, and I need to have relationships because not only do you need people, but everyone in their core heart of who they are, they want to be seen and they want to be known. They want to be seen and they want to be known. You want to be seen, you want to be known. It doesn't have to be by everybody. It doesn't have to be thousands of people. I'm not saying you need hundreds and hundreds of friends, but you need one or two people who see you, who know you, who you are in relationship with. When we have those three things in our lives, freedom, meaning, relationships, we are living a very fulfilled life. We're able to feel like our life is at a good place. And here's the thing, as simple as that sounds, apart from God, apart from the source of the river, apart from the presence of God, those things are impossible to attain in balance. Let me give you an example. What we have experienced in our society is the belief that the most important thing is freedom. That freedom is the most important thing. And at first glance, you're like, yeah, that's great. But freedom has gone from, yeah, we need to be free so that we can worship God, so that we can, we can serve the way, like we have this original idea, to now we're at the context where like, I can define what is good for me however I want because that's freedom. I can do whatever I want, I can buy whatever I want, I can say whatever I want, I can be whatever I want, I can identify however I want because I have freedom. And because I'm free, you can't tell me what to do because I'm free. And even if my freedom impedes on you, it doesn't really matter because I'm free. And what we've seen over the last several hundred years in this experiment is freedom trumping everything else. But the result of defining what is good in your own eyes, it leads to not acting selflessly towards others. It leads, it leads to selfish actions. So therefore, in walking in your freedom and your, your freedom becomes overflowing, your relationships are broken because you are not selfless to others. You are not caring for others. You do not love others. You keep it yourself. So you have a relational deficit because all you care about is yourself. And the only time relationships are worth it is if you can get something out of it. But if you've ever been in a relationship that is only about that, you know it doesn't last very long and you know it doesn't end up very good. But the other thing is this. When we pursue our own fleshly desires, when we pursue our own things in this world, 
It doesn't lead to goodness. I actually have a graph, and maybe this will help you connect the, the, the things. This is a little graphic here. We have this overflowing as a culture, not like you and I, but we have this overflowing of, of a culture. And our inputs as a culture is consumerism, hedonism, individualism, and deconstruction. We're deconstructing everything. We're deconstructing our faith. We're deconstructing the family. We're deconstructing relationships. Like this is like the inputs. And the result is these are all really high on the freedom scale because that's all they feed into. They don't pour anything into your relationships. They don't pour anything into meaning. So the result, when we have the most freedom in the history of the world and the illusion of connectedness and relationships that social media bring but create nothing more than social disconnection, we see isolation, depression, tribalism, paralysis, confusion, and discontent at the greatest levels we've ever experienced, in, in my opinion, in the, in the history of man. And the age with the most connectedness, the most freedom, and the mo like this is what we experience. And it is because, and it is because the principle that God set from the beginning of time that they continue to speak about in the Old Testament, that Jesus taught about in the New Testament, and the disciples continue to do. The best way to live is not to have absolute freedom, but it is to surrender your freedom to one who can tell you what is good. That's what we talked about at Easter, that Jesus surrendered his freedom to die on that cross, to give you your freedom, to give you the opportunity to in turn give that freedom back to him because it is in allowing him to define what is good in your life that he can say, I know exactly how much freedom you need and how much you don't. But the freedom that I give you then, I also invest so that you can have relationships and so that you can have meaning. Because that is ultimately what your heart is desiring because that is how God created you. Just like he created the whole person of who you are, he created you with the intention to have the right amount of freedom, with the right amount of meaning, with the right amount of relationships so that you could feel whole and purposeful in your daily life. It's his system. But we get our system out of order. And, and here's where it really comes down to. These things... These things and what they create in our hearts. And maybe you're sitting here and like it's stirring, it, it creates discontent. Like I don't want this anymore. I don't want absolute freedom because I know where that leads. Maybe you've experienced what I'm talking about. You've had absolute freedom. You've walked in absolute freedom. You've done your own thing and all your relationships broke and you've walked around saying and it's meaningless. You'd be in good company. That's exactly what happened to Solomon. He had everything. Full freedom. No restraints absolute money, and when he's old, he said, vanity, vanity, everything is dust under the sun. Why? Because absolute freedom does not lead to contentment nor to the presence of God. In fact, absolute freedom is the rejection of God's authority in your life. And his authority in your life is because he loves you. Because he desire, because he is the good, good father. Because he is the one who desires to show you his goodness so that you can always be bearing fruit. And so, we have this example. And I do not have time today to fully give you this example. And I knew I wouldn't because it's like probably a separate series. But I, I knew I needed to share it this morning. Because when we have this discontent of this is not right. And we're in this process, which is the next step of being prepared. I believe God is preparing you. I believe his spirit is preparing you. He's renewing inside of your heart. He's showing you things. He's preparing you for what the steps are to come in your life. But in this time of being disconsent, maybe we can make this connection with, with some stories that we can see in the Old Testament. And, and I want to read a passage in Jeremiah here in just a second. But to give you the quick context, again, I don't have the full time, but to give you the quick context, the nation of Israel has been exiled to Babylon. The Babylonians have conquered them, and they've been exiled to Babylon, right? This is after Josiah, we talked about last week. They are in exile. And one of two things has happened within the Jews. A lot of the Jews are like, well... We're Babylonian now, so I guess I'm going to do all the things that the Babylonians do. So I'm going to worship their gods and eat their foods and do their sexual practices. And like, I, I, this is what I is. I'm just going to fully go in it. This is me now. I'm Babylonian. Even though they knew it was wrong, they did it. And then there was this other option, 
which were these groups of people who were like planning rebellion and fighting. And there was all these prophets, they turned out to be false prophets, you know, because they all died, that were saying, God's going to deliver it. Like, we're not going to happen. This isn't going to happen. God is going to free us from this land. He's going to destroy your enemy, and, and you'll be home in a year, and, like, break the yoke. Of, like, oh, there's, like, Jeremiah is full of all these really great stories. You should read it. Like, it's very interesting. We're going to break it. So we need to rebel. And yet Jeremiah, through this whole time, has been saying, no, don't rebel. Yes, you're going to be in exile, which can seem like this weird message from God. But I want to read you this, this passage. And it's actually a familiar passage, but we, a lot of times I only read one part of it. I want to read the whole thing. Jeremiah 29, verse 4. Remember, this is after people have been prophesying all this kind of stuff and, and doing one or the other. It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Listen to this. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens eat their produce, take wives, become the fathers of sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there, and do not decrease. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will have welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets who are in your midst and your diviners deceive you. And do not listen to the dreams which they dream, for they prophesy falsely in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. And now the very famous verse. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare, not for calamity. To give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search with me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. I will bring you back to the place where I sent you into exile. Listen, church. Sometimes when we look around and we feel like maybe we're living in exile. Listen, this theme was picked up by the New Testament writers. That is why it says you are not citizens of earth, you are citizens of heaven. We are actually, as New Testament believers who are in Christ, called to understand that while we are here on earth, you are actually living as exiles who are here waiting for the time when you returned home. But you are exiles who are called to increase, not decrease. To thrive, not to shrink. To bring the presence, not to run away from it. But when we find ourselves living and feeling as exiles and being discontent in what we see around ourselves, many times we do exactly what the Israelites did. We either say, well, this is what the world is now and this is who I'm going to be. Yeah, I just, I mean, this is who it is. I know that's not spoiled. Yeah, but I mean, I'm going to cheat on my wife. I'm going to look at porn. I'm going to be an alcoholic. I'm going to do drugs. I'm gonna, I don't care. It doesn't matter. This is just what the world is now. I mean, I got to just be here. I'm just going to choose what's right. I'm going to do what makes me feel good. Or you have the opposite. We're saying, we have to make this place. We have to defeat this place. We have to destroy this place. This place needs to burn, and we need to get back because this. And then they fight against the very place that God says you're supposed to pray to bless, and in that place you increase. And of all of this says, this sounds eerily familiar. I'm just reading from Jeremiah. If it happens to sound like the last four or five years, it's because some things never change. That when discontent arrives, and that's the first step of this renewal process, the enemy will make you say, yeah, just give it all up. Or the enemy will say, yeah, you should get really angry, and you should break stuff, and you should try to blame everybody else. And yet, Jeremiah says, well, basically, live your life. Love your family. Grow your family. Be in the world, but not of the world. 
You live there, but you're not from there. You walk there, but you're not. And guess what? Daniel did it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did it. That there were these figures who came, and what did they get in trouble for? They got in trouble for being there, but not being there. They didn't get in trouble for planning coups or revolts or assassinations. The only thing that they stuck to was I'm going to worship one God because that is the one thing that I'm not going to compromise on. I will never compromise on the fact that there is only one God, and he is the only one that I'll bow my knee to. But everything else I realize, there's something in this world that I can pray for and that God says is going to be for my good. So that I build homes. I hear people all the time like, I don't know if I want to have kids in the way the world is right now. Why? So darkness wins? Build houses, marry wives, have sons, bring people up in the ways of the Lord so they don't depart on it. Show them the goodness of God, even in the lands of the exiles, because he will bring them out. He will bring them out. And guess what? That same theme, Jesus continues. Jesus, what should we do with Rome? Should we just become like Romans and do all the things they do? Or should we revolt and kill them? I don't care about Rome. Give to Caesar what's Caesar. Give to God what's God. You're in this world, not of this world. You're exiled called to a higher place. So right now, I'm telling you, as you begin to experience holy discontent, or you begin to recognize that that is what you are experiencing, there will be a temptation to go one way or the other, to become judgmental of this world, to become hateful, to become hard, to become bitter, and to look for ways to overthrow it which will lead to you having no opportunity to show Jesus to people. Or there'll be a temptation to just say, I give up. I'm just gonna join with this world. I'm just gonna live in Babylon and become this. And yet, right in the middle is the way of Jesus. The one who says, I can give you the right amount of freedom no matter what the environment, so that you can have meaning and relationships, so that your children can grow and thrive, so that your marriage can be fruitful, so that you can be a tree planted by water, bearing fruit in all seasons. We live in a world that is broken in desperate need of Jesus. And sure, you could join the world, and sure, you could become hard and think that it's just something that needs to all burn up. But Jesus came and lived the visible image of the invisible God with the intention of saying, there's another way here to be in the world, but not of the world, to know where your true home lies, but to be here being missionaries of the goodness of God at every single turn. And he prepares your heart. And he prepares your heart. And he's stirring in your heart. And he says, I have things. And that's why he says, because I know the plans I have for you. Good things to prosper you doesn't look like there's much opportunity for prosper when we turn on the news, but I can tell you, he has good plans for those who realize what citizenship they're in. Because his presence overwhelms you. His fruitfulness overwhelms you. His spirit pours into you. He continually refreshes you. Your reserve never runs dry. No matter how much you draw, it never runs dry because the river continually flows with his goodness. And so here, although we can be citizens of the United States, we also at the same time can know that we are foreigners of this place, exiles, with our hearts looking towards heaven 
but not in the way in which we are of no good now, but in the way of knowing I know my destination, I know where my healing comes from, but in this moment, I will show the goodness of God. I will find the trees that are in dry places and bring them to the water, just like Jesus did for me in my life. Let's pray today. Father, you're so good to us. I thank you in this moment, Lord, that your spirit is revealing the truth in the hearts of those who are here. The truth of where our identity lies. The truth of where our hope is. The truth of where our purpose is. The desire you have to overwhelm us completely with your presence. That we don't have to join in with the world, nor do we have to condemn the world, but we get to be here abounding and prosperous and showing your love and kindness here in this world. Lord, allow this discontent not to make us jaded or hardened, but instead to continue to press into your presence, to experience your goodness so that you can continue to prepare our hearts and how we can contend for a generation of people who desperately need you so that we can come together and lift up the name of Jesus and experience the renewal that you have in our hearts so our spirits can be formed into the image of God so that we can live a life that is a holy sacrifice to you. Spirit, move in this. breathe here. If you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus, I want to give you a chance to do so. I'm going to ask everyone to say this prayer after me. Just say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die for me so my sins could be forgiven, so my heart could be set free. It's in Jesus' name I pray. With every head bowed for just a moment longer, if you made a decision today to accept Jesus, would you raise your hand up anywhere in the room? Just real high. I want to see it and just continue to pray for you later this week. If you're online, they'll put a phone number on the screen that you can connect with our prayer team. But if there's any hands that are up, they can go down. Father, continue to move in our hearts. Search us. Find anything that's not of you so that we can have more of you, so we can experience more of your good love in our lives. Show us how to live the tightrope of exile. But within that tightrope, to see your prosperity and the goodness of your plans. We love you, Father. In your holy name we pray, amen and amen. Church, I love you very much. I'm very thankful for you. If you need prayer for anything, our prayer team's gonna be down here at the front. They would love to pray for you or a loved one. Uh, other than that, man, have a great day. Enjoy this beautiful Sunday. Get outside. It is a good day to be in Oklahoma. Love you guys. Great Sunday.